Well, a very good evening to each and every one of you joining me, Ms. Blinder Scandal, for this week's episode of Your Manchester. And what a fantastic episode it is that we've got lined up for you. Joining us on the show today, we're going to be speaking to Mark Fletcher, Paul Martin, OBE, part of the LGBT Foundation. And as if that's not enough, we're also dealing and delving into the world of We Will Rock You. It's all going on for you. Of course, Manchester Pride is upon us this week and we are looking forward to it. Or are we? Um, we have been, had the privilege and pleasure to speak to the CEO of Manchester Pride. As we do each year, are things getting better? Uh, are things getting worse? We want to hear your comments throughout this show, and uh, we will try and figure out a way to answer as many of them as we possibly can. In the meantime, though, let's first of all look at this interview with Mr. Mark Fletcher, CEO of Manchester Pride. Joining us now is Mr. Mark Fletcher, CEO of Manchester Pride. Welcome. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm excited. It's going to be a good weekend, isn't it? It is. The sun's coming out for us all weekend and we can't wait to get there. And it's a bit of a change from last year. Yes, it is. Uh, over the autumn, we, went, we embarked upon our biggest ever consultation where we really went out there and listened to as many members of our community as, as we could. We've had over 4,500 people respond to us at what was a really difficult time. Um, when we came back with the pandemic in 2021, we delivered a model that we did in 2019 and our communities just didn't want that anymore. So we took time to listen to respond to what it is that communities wanted and what we're delivering now this year is focusing all efforts firstly on activism and protest and secondly in our home in the gay village indeed so why has it only just returned back then to the gay village so in 2021 we delivered a model that we had from 2019 so mm -hmm. just before the pandemic in 2020 we were all set to deliver the same model that we had in 2019 based on the positive feedback that we had we had to press pause on that the pandemic came along and then when we were able to give, be given the green light in 2021 we had seven weeks to deliver the plans and we had we all we all we could do is deliver what we had designed to do previously we were told we weren't able to deliver the parade but everything else was was go um so we delivered the model that we had um and unwittingly you know i, I will say because during the pandemic our communities have had a change of heart as to what the priorities were um and some elements of that festival were less popular which is why we took the bold decision not to deliver mcr Pride so yet. now that it is coming back into the village should people be paying for wristbands etc well, this is the question, isn't it? The, 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 the time old question that's been brought forward and backwards and forwards and backwards. What we're aiming to do is to create a safe event where we can go out and celebrate who we are in a safe space. It's really important to understand that that costs money to deliver an event like this and infrastructure. And we're not subsidised, you know, to celebrate Pride costs money. So as an organisation, what we've done, we've structured a ticket price that covers the cost of delivery of the festival only. No overheads, no charity operating costs. The ticket covers the cost of delivering the festival. And also this year, to be further transparent, We've included a £2.50 direct donation to the community grant so that we can see, as, as, as we're going along, how much money is being put into that pot. But it's dead important for us to show people that this event costs money to celebrate our pride, but that's what the ticket is there for, to cover the cost of that. So to get a pledge band, you're helping to keep the safe, spa the, the safe space and also doing your bits of fundraise for our, our charity partners. So how much of the, the uh, wristband will go to the charity then? So it's £2.50 from every ticket that's purchased, whether that's a day ticket, whether that's a weekend ticket. That's ring fence to go towards the community grants fund. Um, and we'll talk that up. Obviously, when we know how many tickets have we sold, we'll be able to share that in both. So will that make your company a lot more transparent with the amount of money that does go to the charities then? Yeah, well, this is what we're aiming to do. Again, we thought, and again, it's where things get lost. We thought we were being really transparent we learned a lot we need to be more transparent mm -hmm. we need to share more information um, and there's a lot of things that we perhaps didn't think our communities wanted to know that that we wanted to spell out so when it comes to being transparent we, we've been to, we're aiming to be even more clear with our annual report um, so that details what we're spending money on where it goes and the structuring the infographic that we put on our website to show the breakdown of the cost associated with the ticket and then the two pound fifty we feel we've gone a long way and it's been positively received so far so, so we hope that's the level of transparency that, that our community wants and um, because it's perhaps made its way back to the village now then does that mean that you've had to sacrifice some of the larger names and the larger acts and the larger, larger shows that you put on yeah i mean well the thing is that the gay village is always at the heart of the festival that's dead important to remember we never we were never stepping away from the gay village but mm -hmm. we had to change what we were doing because we can see quite clearly the area is very different to what it was in 2018 we don't have the same type of space um, when it came to what it was that communities wanted, they wanted bigger pop-ups. You know, we still get asked, is Kylie coming this year? What are you doing about Lady Gaga? When, when responding to that, we had to find a space that could host that type of production that's required for the artist. We can't do that in the gay village on the restrictive sites that we got. 
But what we've recognised this year off the back of the feedback is that's not deemed so important. What we can do is elevate the queer talent and artists that are living and, and, and performing all year round in Greater Manchester and then bringing some allies along to join us on stage. It's, this year, you're really going to have a sense of identity. We want to platform and champion the talent that's within uh, Greater Manchester and then invite a few friends along to come in. And is it too premature to think about what you'll go to next year? Will next year revert back to previous years where you've had events away from the village so i honestly i wish i could tell you mm-hmm. right now we're at consultation phase and this will happen every year right. and we will ask we will ask our community so this is what we've done what did you like what would you like to see change what worked what 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 was less popular um i'm not sure that 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 model will come back in the future um you know i can have my own personal views on, on, on that um, but from where we are now i'd be quite surprised if communities turn around and said yeah we want that event back next year um, there were split decisions in the consultation. Yeah, there were some calls, calls from some commu- uh, parts of the communities asking if we could bring it back, but at a different time of year, oh. so that the gay village party remains almost sacred. I mean, let's be honest, that, that's, what's in, that's what's important to the majority of our communities is going to the village. Mm. Whether you're going elsewhere or not, yeah. we all want to go into the village. That's what it's there for. And we want to represent who we are and, and feel free in that space. Anything else on top of that has always been an addition or something else to do in response to what it is that people have asked us for. Um, but we'll, we'll have to see. One, one thing's for sure is we have no intentions of stepping away from the village. And what we deliver this year, I'd like to see that this is just continued year after year. So that would be the ideal for you as CEO of Manchester Pride, to stay yeah. community-based rather than what it was when it was festival-based? Well, the festival is the term that we use to describe all the six different key strands mm-hmm. of the events themselves to, collectively. Um, when it comes to what, it, what we offer, it all has to be led by our communities. So if our communities say we want a bigger pop act brought along, then I am aligned with that and will do my duty to see what we can do to make that work. Um, if they say we don't, then we won't deliver that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll listen and respond. So for me, you know, I have my own personal views. I, I love what we're delivering this year. I think it's brilliant. Um, most important is the sense of activism that we've got and mm-hmm. elevating our, our, our further marginalised communities whose voices need to be heard. Um, that's what pride is for me personally. Um, but we'll, we'll see. We, we will listen and then we'll respond and, and we'll, we'll share that with So everybody. going off the, the focus group that you've mentioned, this must be the way forward then. Is this yeah. something that you're happy with? Is this something that you want to that you envisioned as somebody that took this role on? Yeah, so when, when I first came into this role, that was one of the key things that I wanted to do, was saying, look, we're opening the doors here. This is, not, this is not my pride per se, it's everyone's. I'm a member of the community the way that everybody else is a member of the community, so I have my own views and opinions, but my job is to harness all them views and see what we can deliver as, a, as, a, as the pride celebration for Greater Manchester. Do you feel that this is a, a new curve for Manchester Pride, the, the group then, actually listening to the community? Well, what's important to know is when I first stepped into this role, that was one of the key things that we wanted to do was to listen to everybody. You know, I do say this time and time again, I don't own Manchester Pride. I'm fortunate enough to work for an organisation that I'm passionate about. Um, and as a member of the community, I, I have my, my own view as to what, what things could and, and should look like. So we've always consulted. What happened in um, 2021 is there was some misinformation out there or lack of, lack of understanding because we weren't being as clear as we would have liked to have been with some of our communications on, on why decisions were being made. But this consultation was the biggest ever. If we can replicate that, I'll be over the moon because mm-hmm. to have that many voices have a say in what it is that they want from our pride is, is massively powerful and makes our job a lot easier um, to, to deliver what it is that our communities are telling us very clearly that they want. And for these people that are perhaps are unhappy with elements of Manchester Pride, how do they get involved within these focus groups so they can have their voice? Yeah, so there's many different ways. So there's, there's, we try and make it as, as accessible as possible. We have in-person events where you can come along, have your say, listen to us. You can fall, uh, call a free phone line um, anonymously or leave in your details and give your feedback that way. <laughs> you can email in, you can respond to an online um, survey, or we have on the site serve on the ground on site surveys throughout the weekend as well um they're just a number of the different ways you can engage as well as the listening groups that we hold all year round and just manchester pride the organization promise to listen to the points of views of the people absolutely i mean you'll see that in everything that, that, that we what we try to do is where we can't transcribe we'll um, collate all of the information the data that's collected and share that in a way which is really easy just to to read and understand the different views and opinions and then most importantly what we're doing to respond to that and we what we yeah we're going to aim to continue to do that into the future it's going to be amazing uh, one final question is pride a protest or is it a party i think it's both and I think it has to remain both. That's my personal view. We have to celebrate the advancements in equality and the freedoms that we've gained. But we must protest for our siblings who are not all at the same level of equality. And we've got a lot further to go. So it is a celebration, but it is also a protest. Ah, Fletcher, thank you very much. 
Well, there we go. We just spoke to Mark Fletcher there describing that it is a party and a protest. Joining us now from the LGBT Foundation is Mr. Paul Martin, OBE. Welcome, sir. How are you? I'm very well, Belinda. Thank you, darling. How are you? What did you think of some of the points that were raised there then? I mean, is Manchester Pride as a company listening to the people of Manchester? Well, I think your listeners will have to make their own mind up. But from my own kind of perspective, um, I think that we have been working quite closely with Manchester Pride, with Mark personally, and with a number of the other chief execs um, and leaders of other LGBT organisations across Greater Manchester for the last year. I think, as Mark talked about, he has undertaken a community consultation of over four and a half thousand uh, responses. Uh, We talked about that before it went out. We tried to help shape um, the uh, survey. You might remember that last year we issued our own uh, uh, response to sort of like, you know, the initial draft findings of that survey where we kind of like, you know, talked about what we thought were the key priorities that Manchester Pride should uh, uh, focus on in terms of engagement, listening to communities, helping to shape um, the uh, uh, festival with uh, community members' involvement. And they've responded to all of those things. So I think that there has always been from the very, very, very first days of Manchester Pride um, when it was a uh, a stall outside of uh, the Rembrandt. There has always been differences of opinion. People have had different views. It has always sparked a lot of debate. But I think that ultimately Manchester Pride are listening in ways they haven't done for a couple of years. Um, And I think that we should absolutely take them at their word um, for the changes that they are putting in place. And uh, Manchester Pride this year coming back to the village. Um, some saying this is a, a U-turn for the Manchester Pride organisation. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think I think Pride has always been um, uh, in the village. You know, from from the very very early days in the early nineties when I first started to um, attend as a worker, there's always been a presence and focus in the village. Um, the uh, commercial model that Manchester Pride adopted a couple of years ago, including having activities outside of um, uh, the village area. And that obviously caused um, its own challenges and its own controversies. But you've got to remember that Manchester is an incredibly vibrant city. The gay village area is an area under constant development. Um, Areas that previously were available to the festival organisers are no longer available. Developers are building hotels and apartments and all sorts of um, uh, developments on the spaces. So actually having a festival with 40,000 people in the heart of an urban centre is really, really challenging. And I think that, you know, people need to spend a moment thinking about just how complex putting on a festival for that number of people in the city centre actually is. So I think that that there has always been um, uh, 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 the village at the heart of Pride, no matter what. It just so happened uh, that previously they took it, they took some of the activity outside of uh, uh, the village area um, and and the public have responded. There are still many, many people, as, as Mark was saying, that, that, that want um, a, a, a bit of a music festival, they want big name acts, but we just can't put those on in, in, in the gay village area in the way that some people might want. So, you know, six and one half dozen of the other. Some people are really happy, some people are not. And it has always been thus. You've been around the block, love, long enough to know that there's always been controversy uh, about Manchester Pride. There's always been a, a range of different opinions. I was on the board um, in the late 90s, uh, early noughties, um, and and I was sort of like subject to kind of like quite extreme uh, challenge and criticism. There was a website set up about sort of things that I and my uh, other board members should or shouldn't have done. And so there's always been uh, a challenge and controversy about the festival uh, ever since it, it started. And I think that what I would say is to remind people that the festival is run by a very, very small group of people. Um, and these are human beings. They have thoughts and feelings and emotions. And some of this criticism can get very personal and can get very unpleasant. Um, and we should just have a little word with ourselves, I think, in terms of if we disagree uh, with each other, to do it kind of respectfully and to do it in a way that doesn't attack or challenge or criticise other people who ultimately, I think, uh, in their heart of hearts, are trying to do the very best that they can. 
Uh, speaking of the best that they can, of course, uh, Mark Fletcher there was saying that £2.50 from each band purchased for this wonderful event uh, will actually go to the charities. That must be wonderful for you as an organisation to know that some of the money will be going and visibly going to some great causes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think I think having that guaranteed allocation of the ticket price is going back to how it used to be when when ourselves and George House Trust used to run Operation Fundraiser. We guaranteed that a certain percentage of the ticket sales would go to uh, charity, and we were very clear at the beginning where that money uh, went. Uh, Manchester Pride are consulting um, on on where that ticket money might go. I've, I've certainly kind of contributed. Uh, I've been asked my opinion, as has the chief exec of George House Trust, uh, uh, the Proud Trust, AKT, um, and others. We've all contributed our thoughts to what that uh, fund might look like and how people might apply. I think that there's definitely opportunities there for the smaller groups to get funded, for sort of like some of the sports groups, some of the activity groups, some of the groups that don't get kind of funding. I think that's really, really important. Last year, you might remember that working with the Village Business Association and George House Trust, we developed um, a community fund and we distributed £25,000, uh, no, £20,000, I think, to small and unfunded groups, which was amazing and it really makes a difference. So I think that having a guaranteed amount of money going to charity is really, really important from the ticket sales. Um, I also think there are other fundraising activities taking place over that weekend that will also be seeking to kind of like raise money for charity. So I think that... Uh, I, I, as always, I've, I've said this for, for, for many, many years, partying with a purpose always makes Manchester different than other prides up and down the country. Uh, just before we let you go, um, Mr. Paul Martin, uh, do you feel that Pride this year already, before we've got there, has um, done better as an organisation than it has done in previous years? Yeah, I think I think that they really listened to the criticism that was levelled at, at at them, and I think that you know uh, for lots of different reasons um, uh, they they have responded really really positively. I don't think that the criticism is quite as sharp or is quite as pointed online as it has been in previous years, because I think that many many uh, people um, absolutely uh, think that. Um, that 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 uh, they have responded. I mean, I think in many ways, um, Manchester Pride can sometimes feel like a bit of a cactus in the middle of 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 a desert, and and sort of like it can be quite a, a, a challenging um, uh, position to be in if you're running Manchester Pride. And I think you know to give Mark um, his credit, he's he's trying to do the best that he can, and I genuinely think that the team. Are, are trying to do the best for the LGBTQ plus community. And I think that, you know, uh, we, we, we need to support them doing that. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to um, give them the benefit of the doubt. I think that they're being really um, open and candid. I think that they, uh, ha as Mark said, have done a graphic online, which sort of like breaks down where all the money goes to. And people don't realise just how expensive putting a festival uh, like uh, Manchester Pride on ease and that's before you even think about sort of like you know the acts and sort of like you know what your rider is love but I mean the reality <laughs> is <laughs> but 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 the reality is that um, that, that that actually uh, 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 they're doing the best that they can and I think we should give them we should give them all credit for that excellent Paul Martin thank you so much for your time today thank you there we go, everybody. So lots of points of views there. Uh, Pride is going to be fantastic. Uh, Pride can be whatever you want it to be. You can decide whether it's going to be a, a protest or a party. That's up to you. Um, and um, when you are feeling a little bit hungover, there's only one thing to do. That's to check out what's on the television as we get the information from our Hayley Carr. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hayley and welcome to this week's On The Box. How's everyone doing? Now, the first thing I would love to recommend is the second series of Fort Salem is now on iPlayer. It's absolutely brilliant. It's about three young witches who use their powers to defeat supernatural threats. There is also Day Shift on Netflix. That is a horror comedy leaning towards the latter and that has gone on my list to watch. Strictly Come Dancing, for those of you who are fans of the show, this goes back on our screens on the 17th of September and on the 21st of October Netflix will air The School of Good and Evil. Now young heroes and villains are trained to balance good and evil and it's going to star Charlize Theron, Rachel Bloom of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and Ben Kingsley. I can't wait.
And as it's Manchester Pride this week, do pop on all four and give this a watch. It is called Out on Strike and it's about two miners' wives who actually met during the 1984 strike and fell in love. It's a true story and it sounds wonderful. That is on my list for this week. Now, that's it from me. If you are celebrating Manchester Pride, have a brilliant time. And remember, stronger together. Bye. Well, set up as an antidote to the old style beauty contests of yesteryear, this is a very important time for many in the LGBT calendar and no more so than for this gentleman now, Mr. David Allwood. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, Belinda. I'm really good. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Gay How you? England. How does that feel? It's mad, honestly. Like the last sort of 48 hours have just been absolutely crazy since I've won. I'm just, yeah, I'm absolutely over the moon. So why get involved in this then? Why was it so important for you to put yourself forward for Mr. Mr. Gay England? Um, so for quite a while now, I've been doing a lot of community projects in my local area. And I've just um, been doing a lot for charity, fundraising and all that kind of thing. And I just love doing it and I've got a lot out of it. Um, and Mr. Gay England now is not just like a beauty pageant or anything like that. It's it's a real way of making a difference in your community. Like you get a chance to fundraise uh, for charities. Um, they want, they, you, do, you do an exam, you do like an actual, actual test. Um, and when you win, you get a chance to actually roll out a campaign. And it's just something that um, really interested me. I, I do really want to make a difference uh, with this title. So yeah, it's been really fun. And then what was the actual competition itself then? Tell us what was involved in getting to the stage where you are now. Um, so there's loads of different rounds. There's seven rounds in total. There's the uh, charity uh, fundraiser, which was 20% of the final mark. Um, there's also the written test, like I talked about, 20% of that is the written test, which I managed to get an A on, which is really good. Um, <laughs> thanks, love. <laughs> um, uh, then there's uh, the audience vote. Uh, the audience did like a, a vote as they arrived. And then there was... Uh, so there's three um, runway looks. So um, there was, the first one was your regional wear, the second was beach wear, and the last one was uh, formal wear. Um, so and then the final round is Mr. Congeniality, where you give a rose to the person that you'd like to win if you don't win. Oh, you're very yeah. nice, though. We were just looking back at our uh, the last time we had you on the show was way back uh, in May of 2018 when you were part of mm. Miss Saigon. I mean, yeah. how has life changed for you since then? Um, so that I kind of always knew that was possibly going to be my last um, gig as a performer. Um, so I left my agent soon after that and started choreographing and doing all this community work. Um, so yeah, life's kind of it completely flipped. Obviously, everyone's did for a few years. <laughs> um, and since then, yeah, I've just um, I've just been nonstop really. I kind of had a bit of a talking to myself during that time. Um, I think fear held me back from a lot of things for a long time and I just I just wanted to do something that I was proud of and something that can make a bit of a difference um, so I, yeah I sort of stopped listening to the demons in my head and just went for it and and yeah so here I am. <laughs> so how do you go override them demons that are in your head then? How, how would you suggest to other people who are perhaps having these negative thoughts not to have these yeah. negative thoughts and push forward with you know achieving? It's a real process, you know, and uh, like I, I used to just think, oh, I want to do that. But what happens if it fails or what happens if people take it the wrong way or whatever it might be? Um, and that was the voice that kind of won all the time. And I think I just there was a bit of a turning point. It wasn't really a New Year's resolution, but it was the start of this year. Um, I just gave something a go. I started doing um, all these videos for like online content just for a bit of fun. Um, and we end up raising loads of money for charity from doing it. And, and I, I, I got, there was a turning point where someone that was involved in one of the videos sent me a message and said that for the first time they woke up today feeling like they had a sense of belonging and a purpose. Um, and it just really touched me. It was something that really shocked me as well. I didn't expect 
anyone to sort of feel that way from what we'd created. And I, I was just, you know, from, from that, I was like, I need to do more of this and I, I want to do more. I know you are, Mr. You see, what is it you're going to continue achieving now? Um, so there's there's been a lot of meetings already with um, Stuart, who's like the owner of Mr. Gay England, like the um, the, uh, the campaigns. And from the start, I've kind of wanted to do something that combats loneliness within the LGBTQIA community, um, and bringing try and find a way of bringing people together and not feeling so disconnected. Because there's a lot of sort of there is a lot of segregation in the gay in the gay world. I don't know if you feel the same, but we kind of categorise people and put people in boxes, and and really we we should kind of find the power in, in togetherness a little bit more and not feel like we have to separate. Um, and 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 that goes for all age groups as well. There's a lot of um, kind of concern with like the younger generation, and obviously that is still a major factor, but. I also feel like a lot of um, of older people in the community feel a little bit uh, detached or forgotten about in in mainstream media. So I also there's definitely something I want to do, which is try and um, keep rolling out um, LGBTQIA um, care homes and mm -hmm. try and champion champion that. And you know, think about you know that this is a process that we're all going through in, in life. And that last part of it is kind of forgotten about for our community. And I, I want to try and do something for that. And just because I'm not maybe that age doesn't mean that it, it doesn't affect me. I feel that's what I mean about the togetherness thing. I feel like we should all do something for each other. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your fantastic oh, award. Oh, and uh, I couldn't you. imagine it going to a better person because I know the kind oh, heart that so you are. Sweet. And I know that it will do wonders if you're able to use this platform. So thank you very much for your time today, David. Thank you. Oh, Belinda, thank you so much. It's honestly so good to see you again. You look amazing as always. Thank you, my darling. Have a fabulous time. Where are you? I'm in Mykonos. I'm about to join the Atlantis cruise for a week of work. So, And why not? Life. And it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> We've just it started is. the rain here in Manchester. It's all going well. Thank you very well, much, David Bride. Allwood. And I, thank people. you, darling. I'll see you very, very soon. Thank you. Well, coming to Manchester very, very soon is the wonderful We Will Rock You, the musical that features all the songs from Queen. And we were lucky enough to speak to Mr. Michael McKell. And what an opening night he had. And so we opened in Portsmouth on this current leg of the tour. This is post-pandemic. And on the opening night, Brian May came out and played Bohemian Rhapsody on, live on stage with us. Now, the last time I'd seen him play that live, I was in the audience at the Wembley Empire Pool Stadium. And it was four days after Lennon had been shot. And he and Freddie sang Imagine. And you've never seen so many people cry in your life. Mm -hmm. And it was then at a time before the lights on our phones, people lit their lighters. So flash forward, I'm now on stage. It's Portsmouth, the opening night. The same man is playing the guitar solo. And the first three rows that I can see, some still scared, wearing masks or in tears. So it was a very interesting time, very emotional time. Now, the whole thing with this show, and my friend Ian Wherry, who's was a producer, musician, he was in the audience at South End. He said, you don't realise just how much love is in the audience. And it sounds like a bit of a cliche. But... So yeah. to have what we've just gone through, it has a different sort of resonance. So yeah, to be part of this is why, extraordinary. Why is the music still so poignant? Why? What is the secret ingredient that Queen's music still has? Because like you say, it, it's got a full on legacy. It's gone from the very beginning of the 70s right to, well, to, at the moment as we speak, we're talking about you going with this wonderful show. What's so important about their music? Because they, that rarity, um, I mean, Bowie always did it. Bowie, but Bowie was kind of left of field. The only time he went mainstream was Let's Dance, really. So he's always left the field, but was constantly reinventing. Queen did that, but reinvented in the commercial sense. So you've got things like things that shouldn't be commercial, like Bohemian Rhapsody, an eight minute song. So if you're on a commercial station, hold it a minute, when am I going to put my adverts for various products in? This is eight minutes. Yeah. That's why most songs, you know, are two minutes, 30, three minutes, because there's gaps for commercial, because it's about, it is show business, it's about making money. And so you've got the, the operatic opus of Bohemian Rhapsody. Then you've got another one, Bites of Dust, out and out dance track, crazy little thing called Love, homage to Elvis. 
uh, with basically Freddie doing an Elvis impersonation. Um, and but such a, 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 a breadth of material that even if you are not a Queen fan, you would like. I would suggest putting this show together. Um, that, that there is so much going on behind the scenes, on stage, in preparation, rehearsal. It must be a manic time to get this show to the perfection standards that it is. It is. It's, a, it's like with the circus rolling into town. Like Saturday night, that will be stripped down. Our guys will probably hit their beds at about 4 a.m. in the morning. And then they're up on the Sunday. Trucks running out to Newcastle, setting up. Monday setting up. We're in sound check. Three o'clock, 7.30. We're on stage ripping up Newcastle. And that has been how we've been rolling. Um, and it is full on. We've got like a, we couldn't do any of it without a, a fantastic crew. People like Paul Duffy, who's it's all behind us, and, and, and our, our sound people that are just extraordinary. Jay Dodds and just just our crew. Just you can't you can't operate. You know, even actually, actually in wardrobe, you know things that you just she sorts out for you. Hannah sorts stuff out for you. And Eloise sorts makeup and hair out because there's wig. And that's the thing about these kids when they're not on stage they're not sitting down they're taking wigs off they're putting new costumes on like wearing four layers of tights so it's like we can strip this one strip this one and then, and they're singing at the same time because <laughs> their mics are live and it's it's i mean there's a there's a there's a different show backstage mm. <laughs> a much different show uh, but it, it it's part of the energy of that and that energy comes on stage and as i said we get to bathe in the, the legacy of of Queen's music and the affection that, that brings. So I've been so Michael, very fortunate. What keeps you going then? What keeps me going? Some, yeah. my, my friend Ashley was in yesterday. He said, what, how, how are you doing that? I said, look, I went to see Mick Jagger at Hyde Park um, with my girlfriend, Sarah. And I, I saw a, a man doing laps at 78. So there you oh. go. That's that's what I've got to reach out for. It's amazing. Listen, we've got to wrap up now. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, just in a nutshell, just to make people fully aware of this, why should people come and watch this wonderful show? It is the greatest rock comedy show on the market, and we will take you away from any problem you've got in your life for two and a half hours, make you laugh, cry, sing, stomp your feet, rattle your jewellery and clap your hands. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. What is rock and roll? It's anything you want it to be. It's sex. It's rebellion. It's real. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Nels There, for making sure we're all fully suitably satisfied with their massive, gorgeous, beautiful pizzas. And of course, don't forget, We Will Rock You is at the Palace Theatre from the 5th to the 10th of September. Tickets are flying out like no tomorrow, so make sure you catch that. Uh, however, if you are planning to do Pride this weekend, you'll want to know what the weather's all about. Let's find out from Mr Paul Rudd. Today I'm here in Glossop, where there's a classic car rally taking place. So this car is a 1957 Sunbeam Mark III. Here's this week's weather. Thursday is sunny and cloudy with the temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius. Friday is sunny and cloudy with a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. And as we head into the weekend's weather right now, 
Saturday is sunny and cloudy with a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius and Sunday is also looking sunny and cloudy with a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius and it's not looking bad for Manchester Pride weekend. Have a good one everyone. All right so from one classic to another it's time to head over back to the studio for this week's amazing episode of your Manchester. Beep beep, out of my way please. Beep deed out of everybody's way thank you very much there mr paul rudworth for that fantastic weather so it might be all right this weekend everybody whatever you're doing make sure you are being absolutely fabulous and safe manchester pride this weekend coming from manchester's wonderful gay village everybody yay now do not forget do not forget everybody that next week we will bring you our special video from the pride parade it's very self in the meantime take care of yourselves each other and i'll see you all very soon only on your manchester